This lecture is part of an online course on modular forms and will be about the action of the group SL2Z on the upper half plane H. So this is just complex numbers tau with the imaginary part of tau greater than zero. And you remember the action is given by um, ABCD acts on tau as A tau plus B over C tau plus D. Um, and last lecture we were looking at modular forms and mentioned we wanted to prove that spaces of modular forms are finite dimensional, which we'll do next lecture. Um, but for that proof we need some results about the geometry of SL2Z and its fundamental domain on H, which I'm going to give this lecture. Um, so first of all, we recall we can think of H as being the same as lattices um, L um, in C um, with a basis omega 1, omega 2. Um, and these lattices are up to rescaling. Um, and furthermore, the basis should be oriented, which means the imaginary part of omega 2 over omega 1 should be greater than 0. Um, and this correspondence is given as follows. Um, first of all, if we've got an element tau off the up, up the upper half plane, this gives rise to a lattice generated by 1 and tau. On the other hand, if we've got a lattice generated by omega 1 and omega 2, we just make that correspond to the vector tau equals omega 2 over omega 1. So um, elements of the upper half plane are sort of the same as lattices with a basis up to rescaling. Um, so the action of SL2 of z on this acts as a change of basis. Okay, and that, now I can explain the problem we want to solve this lecture. The problem um, is to find a fundamental domain of SL2z on the upper half plane H. So what does a fundamental domain mean? Well this means a region, so each tau is equivalent um, under SL2z to a unique point of the fundamental domain. Um, well, it turns out to be easier to think of this in terms of lattices. So, so um, the problem, given a lattice L in C, find a canonical basis, omega 1, omega 2 for it. And we can do this as follows. We can just pick omega 1 to be the shortest vector obviously other than zero. <coughs> and this is usually unique up to sign, um, but sometimes not. So let's put unique with a question mark in because may, maybe it is unique and maybe it isn't. And we can put omega 2 to be the shortest vector, which is not a multiple of omega 1. And again, um, we can ask, is this unique? And if omega 1 is unique up to sine and omega 2 is unique, then we've sort of found a canonical um, basis for the lattice. So we've sort of found a canonical point of the upper half plane. Um, so let's see what condition do these two conditions have on tau? Well, um, let's draw a picture. So um, we can take but by rescaling, we can take tau to be omega 2 and 1 to be equal to omega 1 because we can just divide everything by omega 1 to make omega 1 equal to 1. Um, and then we've got the following two conditions. So here's the point omega 1 of our lattice. And now we want, um, we, we look at this circle which says that omega 2 has absolute value equal to omega 1. And since omega 1 is the shortest vector, what we want is that omega 2 
should be greater than or equal to omega 1, which is equal to 1. So omega 2 has to lie outside this circle in the upper half plane. Um, and now let's draw a couple more lines, so minus a half and a half. And I'm going to draw the lines going up here. And now this line here corresponds to points where omega 2 is equal to omega 2 minus omega 1. At least the absolute values are the same because you remember omega 1 is equal to 1. And this line here is points where omega 2 has absolute value equal to omega 2 plus 1. Um, so um, in both of these cases, th 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 these correspond to points where there's a sort of um, ambiguity about what omega 1 and omega 2 are. So let's see what goes on at these points. So here, um, um, we, we see that if omega 2 is to the right of this line, then we can make it smaller by subtracting omega 1 from it. And similarly, if it's the left of this line, we can make it bigger. So we can always arrange that omega 2 lies inside this region here. So omega 2 is somewhere here. Um, and now we can ask, is omega 2 unique? Um, and it turns out it's not quite unique. So, so what can happen is, first of all, we can have, um, if, if omega 2 is somewhere here, then um, omega 1 and omega 2 sort of form a, a sort of short fat diamond. And um, what happens is that omega 1 and omega 2 have the same absolute value. So instead of choosing omega 1, we could have chosen omega 2. And if we do that, we find that that, 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 that corresponds to sort of changing tau to this point over here. So this is tau goes to minus 1 over tau. So really, um, um, the, the, these two points correspond to the same lattice. Um, similarly, if we've got a point here, it corresponds to a sort of long, thin um, lattice because we might have 1 here, sorry, 0 here, and omega 1 here, and omega 2 might be, say, up here, but it could also be here. So um, um, th these correspond to lattices where, where, where the fundamental domain is a sort of long, thin diamond. And again, if omega one is omega two is here, it, it corresponds to the same lattice as if omega two is here. So these two points correspond, and they're they're sort of joined by sending tau to tau plus one. And you can check that these are the only ambiguities. So the fundamental domain looks like this region, except we have to remember to identify um, this bit with this bit by changing tau to minus 1 over tau. And we have to remember to identify the left-hand side here with the right-hand side here by changing tau to tau plus 1. Um, by the way, um, you may have noticed there are two very special cases, which are this point here. So this corresponds to a sort of um, something where 1 where 0 and omega 1 and omega 2 form an equilateral triangle. And um, this lattice is rather special because um, normally there are two choices for omega 1, but in this case there are actually six choices for omega 1. So the lattice is particularly symmetric. And this point is also a bit special because um, it corresponds to a sort of square lattice, naught omega 1 omega 2. And in this case, there are four choices for omega 1. Um, so um, these two points cause complications. They're, they're, they're sort of called elliptic points. And they're, they're points where the lattice has extra um, symmetry. Um, let me just make that a bit clearer since this green pen seems to be due for retirement. Um, Um, and we will see in the theory of modular forms that, that there are constantly minor problems turning up because of these two special points corresponding to slightly, slightly special lattices.
Um, by the way, some authors like to define the fundamental domain by carefully removing this bit of the boundary and this bit of the boundary so that every point of the upper half plane corresponds to a unique point of the fundamental domain. I think that's a bad idea. It's much better to keep the fundamental domain closed and just remember that you have to identify a few points on the boundary. Um, so what happens if we actually do that? Well, well, imagine you take a pair of scissors and cut out this fundamental domain and then join the boundary up like that. So by joining this boundary to this boundary, you're sort of going to get a cylinder. And then by closing off these two edges, you're sort of going to cl close down one end of the cylinder. And what you end up with is something that's actually um, topologically homeomorphic to just an open disk. Um, well, what we want to do is, is to turn that disk into a sphere by adding a point at infinity. So I'll sort of explain a bit how to do that. Um, so first of all, if we've got a modular function or modular form, say, then f of tau is equal to f of tau plus 1. So this means f can be written as a function of um, q, where q is equal to e to the 2 pi i tau. So this is just a sort of either Fourier series or Laurent's expansion of f. And this is expanded around q equals naught, which corresponds to tau being equal to i infinity. So you can think of tau as being a point that's somewhere way up, way up here. Um, you, you sort of just let the imaginary part tend to infinity. And we're going to say the order of the zero of f at i infinity is defined to be the order of the zero of um, sum of a n q to the n at q equals zero. And we will see the reason for this next lecture when we try and count the number of zeros of f because it turns out you need to count the number of zeros at i infinity in order to get a nice answer. Similarly, we say that f is holomorphic at i infinity means that f is equal to a naught plus a one q and so on. So there, there have to be no negative powers of q. So that's the same as saying f is holomorphic at q equals zero. Um, so the, the, the point i infinity is called um, a cusp. So it's not really quite um, it's sort of in the boundary of the upper half plane in some sense rather than actually in the upper half plane. The reason it's called a cusp is if you change tau to minus 1 over tau, then our fundamental domain, which originally looks like this orange region, becomes um, this, this red region here. And the point I infinity... Um, becomes minus 1 over i infinity, which is just equal to 0. And you can see that near 0, this region does indeed look like a cusp. So a cusp, cusp, a cusp just means something that's a bit pointy. And you can see this is indeed pointy, like a cusp of a mountain or something. I should say that um, SL2z, or possibly PSL2z, depending on um, your conventions, is an example of a Fuchsian group. So a Fuchsian group means just a discrete subgroup of SL2 of, of R, which acts on the upper half plane. Um, and there are lots of other examples of Fuchsian groups. For example, we can take SL2Z and map it to SL2Z modulo NZ. Um, and the kernel will be another Fuchsian group, which is sometimes called um, gamma of n. And this turns up a lot in the theory of modular forms. Modular forms for this group are called modular forms of level n sometimes. Um, and these groups also have fundamental domains, and they kind of look a bit like the fundamental domain for SL2z, except they're more complicated and they might have more cusps and might look something like this. Um, so th th this might have three cusps and several other um, so-called elliptic points, which are the analogues of, of these points for SL2. Um, there are also things called Kleinian groups, which are discrete subgroups of 
um, SL2 of the complex numbers and this acts on the Riemann sphere and there's a whole theory of Kleinian groups which is in some ways analogous to the theory of Fuchsian groups but we're not going to talk about those much. Um, so what we're going to do next lecture is to prove a fundamental theorem about um, modular forms which says that the number of zeros of a modular form in the fundamental region is equal to the weight over 12 as long as you count the zeros in the right way and then we will use that to classify modular forms.